So I'm honored to be here with Macon, Cowles. Cowles? Actually, Coles. Coles. All right, let's try that again. I'm honored to be here with Macon Coles, who I've known for many years, but can't seem to get your last name correct. It's Coles, not Cowles. I would never make that mistake personally. Um, and you've served for a long time. How, how many years? It only seems like a long time. It's been six years that oh, I've been that City long. Council. I had huh. a two-year term in 2007 and a four-year term in 2009. And uh, what possesses you and allows Regina, your wonderful wife, to allow you to want to serve more? Because it's a lot of work, right? It is a lot of work. Yeah. Um, and particularly with an ambitious council as this one has been. Yeah. We've had, um, we put a lot on our work plan two years ago and we're just now finishing it up so that almost uh, every single week we get a packet of 500 pages right. memo information about the different projects that we're wrapping up after two years but the primary things that that's a lot of trees right there uh, no because it's electronic and so right. we uh, it's a lot of finger pushing and cleaning of the iPad surface is right. your, your fingers get sweaty right. when you get to the budget part and right. wonder how you're going to pay for the aspirations that this community has uh -huh. to reduce carbon emissions, to provide fine libraries and parks to everyone, to take care of the people that are in need in our town, to help the school system with early childhood education, as we've done. Very unusual thing for mm. city to be involved in, but we know that that's a critical period mm. of children's lives, and so we want to give as many of those young kids we can a head start and help their families. Is that like at Mapleton? What's yeah, going on at, at Mapleton Early Childhood Center. And, um, but the, we're in the middle of a, a project right now that's a legacy project. It's forming a municipal utility. Mm -hmm. And the lines are drawn. We are, um, the citizens have made it quite clear with their part active participation in the development of this idea and the framework for it that we want to form a municipal utility so that we can bring the, the decision making for a municipal utility to Boulder, to our local people, not have it go on at the Public Utilities Commission. And what's the point of that? Is it to reduce carbon emissions? It's to reduce carbon emissions um, and to make some other decisions about our energy future that right now we're powerless to make because we're... Literally powerless. Yeah, like we're 3% that. of Excel's whole system and uh, uh -huh. they have a one-size-fits-all mentality mm. uh, and making a lot of money is an important part of that one-size-fits-all for Excel. And you were a, or are a prominent lawyer? You still work as a lawyer? I, I do still work as you a do? lawyer. Yeah. Um, what was one of your, you have a very famous case in your history. I, d I do. I'm, a, I'm an environmental and civil rights lawyer, but when I say I'm an environmental lawyer, I don't mean that I work for corporations to help figure out how to comply with the law or, or exploit loopholes. I, since uh, the late 80s, I've represented citizen groups and animals, um, ha wildlife habitat in various cases involving the destruction of the planet. And one of those I think that you're referring to is I was lead environmental lawyer in the Exxon Valdez oil spill litigation, right. suing Exxon for the cleanup of the Prince William Sound. And the uh, state and federal judges up there also appointed me to be one of seven on the executive committee that tried to coordinate all 170 cases that had been filed against Exxon for the fishermen, for the hotel operators, the municipalities up there, the native Alaskans, all of the, the people who were harmed by that occurrence. Yeah. So um, what are some accomplishments you're particularly proud of or want to continue to focus on uh, from your last term? Well. My work, Waylon, in, in the environmental sphere as an environmental lawyer taught me that we cannot save the wild places in the world, the Prince William Sound, the forests that are just west of here, the 
rushing waters of our streams and rivers unless we get the metabolism of the cities right. Because the cities have very long supply lines that stretch out really around the world to provide energy, fossil fuels, timber, special hardwoods, brick and mortar and tile and marble and all those things that people want, steel and concrete. So another part of um, what, what I'm proud of having done on the planning board and then on the city council after that is to work on changing of land use regulations so that the uh, we, we develop more 15-minute neighborhoods in Boulder. Those, mm -hmm. those are neighborhoods where uh, everybody can walk to the things that they need within 15 minutes of their home, mm -hmm. including to regional transit, which will take them out of, right. out of their home, out of their town. That's great. Or they need to get elsewhere. That's kind of the new urbanist idea as well, just it, that everyone's self-contained and can... And community is strong, everyone runs into each other and knows each other. It is. Yeah. And we have a we we have a ways to go yet in Boulder because the the model of the city outside of its core is very suburban. But uh, increasingly people who live in these suburban areas, north, south, east, are calling on us or asking us to help them develop fifteen minute neighborhoods. I commute to work in Denver and frequently my seatmates are people that are also either living in Denver and working here, living here and working in Denver. And I've been struck actually by... You mean on the buses? On the bus, uh -huh. on, the, on the regional bus. And do you I take your bike on the bus? I do. Nice. Yeah, and I've got a mile and a half pedal down the bike path when I get there. It's a very pleasant commute. But um, I've been struck with the fact that that young workers in their 20s and early 30s many of them choose as a matter of preference to live in Denver even though they work here because oh, yeah. they don't find the kind of snap and action and and 24-hour neighborhoods that they do in Highlands or the Central Platte Valley or Capitol Hill or Baker mm -hmm. in Denver so um, I, I want to respond to that so there are two drivers of of changing land use regulations one is to make it a, a more fun, happy, kind of hip developing place, a place of creative ideas where creative people want to be. But the second is to reduce the energy use uh, by the way we live. And uh, that means more efficient buildings, it means taking charge of our electricity supply, it means making that, that link to sensible transportation so you don't have to drive everywhere. So, um because there's a lot to touch on, but what what would you do maybe on, on that note? What would you do in terms of uh, maybe transportation, beginning with transportation? Well, um, we've got we've got several challenges before us. And first, I just want to draw a baseline. We had our first transportation master plan in 1987. <clears throat> We revised that in 1993, and the vehicle miles traveled by people in automobiles in Boulder has stayed pretty much flat since then. That is a remarkable achievement because region-wide in Denver, vehicle miles traveled per person has increased 40%. Wow. What we now know is that as we build highway capacity, that there's the phenomenon called induced traffic. You, you build it and actually it fills up because we don't just get where we're going faster, but we drive further. And so it ends up taking about the same commuting distance. All right, so with that as a, and, and the reason that we've been able to hold it pretty much flat is because of the EcoPress program that we have. We, we have, because of the bike lanes and bike paths that we have, because of pedestrian facilities, and because we've made our, with some of the, the land use regulations, the historical preservation, saving our downtown, we've actually, there are a lot of places where it's very interesting to walk, yeah. to be a pedestrian, to experience the street as you go along, instead of walking along the side of, shall we say, a, 
a big box store, a windowless big box store. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we've got two challenges really. One is with 50,000 or so cars coming into Boulder every day, we've got to deal with that. And that you, the, the commuter, um, the, the commuter rush in and out of town every day is one of the most difficult planning problems to solve. And that's about 50,000 cars? Yes. Wow. And uh, nearly all them. of them, one person. So right. what we, we have to do is get control of the parking. And the places where we have managed parking, that means parking has a price attached to it. It's not free. And those places in Boulder where we've done that would be downtown and on the university. If you're driving to those destinations, you're going to pay to park your car. That's enabled us to move people to other modes of transportation. So in the downtown area, only 37% of people who work down there drive in, in a single occupant vehicle. And that compares statewide with about you know, 15%. Um, I'm sorry, 85% uh, of people. So let me just be clear on that. Only 37% do that in downtown Boulder. The rest of the state, you're talking about 85% of so people you've get to work by a car. 60% or something. Yeah, yeah, it's huge. So the other, so we, we've got the parking that needs to be managed with respect to the income commuters. And then the other thing we need to do is, and we can do, is make cycling a lot safer in town. Yeah. So, you know, the city uh, transportation department has been an experiment with striping, with painting yeah. the bike lanes. That's green. exciting. Um, yeah. There, uh, you know, there's curb separation that can be done to actually change the elevation of the bike lanes. and. I'm sure anybody listening to this uh, who has gone to a website and taken a look at what they do in Amsterdam, anywhere in Holland, is just struck with how many cyclists there are. Yeah. And we can do the same thing here. We're actually going to put a counter downtown on the 13th Street contralateral uh, bike path. I think that's what they call it. Contralateral. contralateral Cont uh, or contra Counter direction, you know, the idea is that, that the cars are headed I north, see. the cyclists are headed south in a bike lane, and we're, we've got a counter embedded in the street. We're going to put a, a um, we're going to put a digital sign up there so people can see the daily count and the yearly count of, of bicycles that pass by there, because it's important for people to know we're making progress in these areas. Yeah, that's that's exciting to me. I mean, I, I travel a fair amount and, you know, in Manhattan, wherever you go, Brooklyn, even L.A., um, you know, having the separated bike paths in Amsterdam, of course, you, you see when bicycling gets treated as a form of transportation, not as something you kind of, like a night street, it's a nightmare, you know, it says just ride in the lane down downhill and every car will pass you as you go, yeah. which I understand they want to. Yeah. They're a lot faster. Mm-hmm. But it's dangerous. Yeah, it is. It's scary. It's scary to me, and I'm a daily cyclist. Right. So. No, it is, and uh, you know, with with cycling being such a an important part of the culture in Boulder, yeah. we're reminded constantly as people are injured or killed while cycling that it, this is a dangerous occupation. We need to do what we can yeah. to make it much safer for people to use on a daily basis. Yeah, and it's obviously safer in the sense that uh, you know it combats obesity. It's healthier. Things like that. Yes. Um, what? But what do you do in terms of those fifty thousand cars coming in? Like, is there a light rail or more buses, or what can we do about that? Well, we know a lot of those come in from the east and not necessarily in thirty six. So it's and the the public transportation is almost non-existent out there. Uh -huh. um, so we need, and we have unfortunately, uh, RTD has chumped Boulder. <coughs> on Boulder County on its promises of bringing light rail to our right. town and so that's that's got people scrambling how are we going to first of all let's identify what the new paths are for in commuting and then let's let's get some transit routes out there but also unless people have a price to pay for driving in town mainly parking they're going to you know pay a parking tab uh we're not going to get control over it. It's huh. too convenient and easy and cheap. So it's, you have to have the carrot of providing buses or whatever, and you have to have the stick of parking. We'll right. Get here. That's right. Parking costs. And you need to, 
You know, we shouldn't go further with facilitating the uh, the passage of automobiles in and out of our town. Unfortunately, no. CDOT is just making big improvements along Arapaho to the east. Now, the the motors who come from the east are going to like that, or yeah. our our commuters who are going to the east to work are going to like that. But you know what what you end up with is, if you think of uh, parking. And because uh, I said we have to get control of parking. If you think of parking as two ends of a dumbbell, of a barbell, with a thin bar between it and bulbous parking on either end, the parking's where we park our cars at our houses in the morning and then at our places of work in the afternoon. The, uh, the part in between is the road infrastructure you have to build to make this press of automobiles get out and transit that distance during the day. And so if you, if you don't have control of parking, you've got plenty of free parking, it draws more traffic into mm -hmm. the system. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the tremendous expense of expanding lane capacity, which is this thin part of the barbell that I was talking about. And as you said, the more you expand it, the more cars actually use it and it gets slower again. Yes. So. So let's let's move into other issues. Maybe um, uh, social issues, uh, affordability, affordable housing. What we're trying to do with affordable housing is is to continue to make affordable housing, permanently affordable housing, available to people on the low end of the income scale, low to very low income. You know, our affordable housing program it addresses a, a range of needs from people who are living at or below the federal poverty line up to people who are maybe making uh, sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year for a family of four and yet that's that's tough going in Boulder um, yeah. that income for as expensive as everything is. In addition to the and our goal is to make ten percent of our housing stock which is forty five thousand units, to make 10% of that or 4,500 units permanently affordable. In addition to that though, I want to see us uh, work on market rate affordable housing. That is changing some land use regulations so that people can have alley houses, um, duplexes, granny flats in their neighborhoods. It will help the main house pay for its mortgage and provide some less expensive housing for people who want it. Um, many, uh, a lot of the people that I was talking about that I sit next to on the bus are looking for places downtown that they can live in, and, and they're, you know, Whittier is, is full of these alley houses that people love. North Boulder we have some at the Holiday Drive-In site, but other neighborhoods want to have this feature also. Yeah. So you get two types of market rate affordable housing, the, the little unit in the back that can be rented out and then it makes the main house mortgage more affordable to people that are able to buy that. Yeah, we talked about that with Mary and Sam, but it would certainly be uh, nice up here, you know, as well. I feel like, you know, the hill is always a unique situation, but, um, uh, and we'll, we'll uh, just touch on this briefly, but, um, you know, I have five students living next door illegally. Yeah. Uh, I think they're allowed three or four, I'm not sure. Three unrelated. Three. Um, and that kind of, density which in some ways is great uh, but creates these you know kind of uh, college ghetto like huge party kind of atmosphere yeah. it would disperse within the neighborhood if you know someone could rent here if it became more affordable if yeah. there was more stock but anyway um, what other issues have we not touched on that you're passionate about well part of reducing the energy demand of a, of a town is addressing the energy efficiency of buildings and yeah. so it, it's a tough nut to crack because we have a most of our town is built out so the buildings we have now are still going to be here in 50 years the question is how do you get people to uh, renovate those buildings and make them more efficient if we have a municipal utility we can actually float the bonds and the utility instead of buying more generating capacity to heat and light those homes can pay for the renovations and then the bonds are paid for with the sa energy savings over time. So um, that's another area, another reason why I think formation of a municipal utility is a good thing. Mm -hmm. But we've already addressed in Boulder 
the energy efficiency of residential rental units through our smart regs program. Mm -hmm. Now we have to turn to the commercial multi-tenant office buildings and um, we can do that through similar smart regs that we adopted in cooperation with the residential landlords. We need to ask the question to them because they've got children and grandchildren. They, they need to let us know how they're going to upgrade their buildings because they really need to be upgraded badly. Yeah. And uh, it'll also, so I think what we'll have to do is get into a licensing situation where as with residential uh, leaseholds and commercial, you have to apply for a city license every three years to lease out space in your office building. And then over time, we will tighten up those those efficiency regulations and be able to check back with the owners and making sure they're reaching their goals. That's low hanging fruit right there, it sounds like. I mean, I'm sure a lot of that commercial space has not been improved for ever. Yes, and the, we've got the problem with split incentive, which is if the owner of the building does the improvements, it's the tenant that gets the benefit of it. So right. we can do some things as a city to break that split incentive and line them up so everybody's on the same page. Hmm. The other thing we have to do, obviously, is get to owner-occupied um, houses. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where everybody lives. Everybody's going to be concerned about what is the cost of this. But because there's a long payback on these investments in energy efficiency, a utility which can bond for the energy savings can, can do this in a way that actually is robust economically. We know that to bring the commercial residential buildings in our town up to uh, the, the standards of efficiency of the 2012 International Energy Efficiency Code, with, which we just adopted, it would cost $600 million. That's a lot of construction, a huge benefit to our town and the region to do that over, in a staged matter, rolled out over the next five to ten years. And it would have huge benefits. Tremendous benefits. Yeah. Lower energy bills for everybody, lower long-term use of energy. It reduces the metabolism of our city. Hmm. Well, Macon, Coles, uh, thank you so much. Your enthusiasm is uh, sort of surprising after serving, <laughs> serving for so long. I've been to many meetings, and they're long <laughs> meetings. So thank you. Thank you, yeah. Waylon. I yeah. appreciate your having me. Oh, cool. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm.